The SARS coronavirus 2 pandemic has helped us all to learn something new. Some have learned to make homemade bread, while others have learned that you can never have enough toilet paper in your house. International markets have learned something else, that we all depend a lot on China. The world needs masks. China makes them, but has been hoarding them. As China grappled with the coronavirus, it kept the masks it made. Now that other nations need them, pressure is rising on Beijing to resume exports. Exactly. After decades of outsourcing production, we have encountered a shortage of masks in the middle of a pandemic. So what happened? Well, the Chinese have been working their socks off. In one month, comparing March to April, China was able to multiply its exports. They doubled the number of respirators and protective suits increased mask exports by six times and exports of coronavirus detection kits were 25 times higher. We are talking about millions of tons of medical equipment destined for the international market. And you're probably wondering, what does all this mean? Well, basically, we've become too accustomed to our made in China products. Most companies don't even think twice. Every time they set up a new factory, China is the preferred choice. So why is this the case? Well, it's partly because everything's cheaper, but that's not the only reason. China also offers other advantages. It has built the necessary infrastructure to export worldwide. And anyone who wants to manufacture something knows that if they can find good suppliers and good manufacturers, it's in China. After years of being the world's favorite factory, China Chinese workers are increasingly better skilled. Put another way, imagine you want to build an electronics company. Your best option is to go to Shenzhen. It's all there. You'll find cheaper labor than the United States. But Shenzhen is also the home of the Huang Wangbai, which is one of the largest markets for electronic components on the planet. And I'd like to apologize again for my terrible pronunciation of many of the places that are going to come up in this video. So you go to Shenzhen and you say, hello, good morning. I'm looking for this next generation controller board for the drone I want to build. And before you know it, you'll find a gentleman who sells boards of that type by the kilo. You can literally see images online of people going to this flea market to buy bags of microchips. There are few places on the planet where you can do that. So it's already clear, China is made for manufacturing. But, of course, when a pandemic arrives, you see the drawbacks of relying so much on China. And hold on just one moment, because companies must take into account other risks beyond pandemics. We're talking about politics, too. As we all know, Trump waged a trade war with China. But make no mistake, Trump isn't the only one who wants to stop doing business with Beijing. Take a look at Japan. Japan set aside 243.5 billion yen to help firms shift production out of China. As you can see, in the current environment, the idea that globalization is a great idea seems to have run its course, as many feel that China can no longer be trusted and we need to restart production in several countries again. The once happy world in which we all jetted around the globe, holding hands and singing kumbaya and ignoring borders is no more. So today's question is, do they really see it that way in the corporate world? Are companies thinking of leaving China? Today, we're going to answer these questions, but first, let's take a look at some history. The Great Chinese Demand Globalization first became a buzzword in the 1990s, and it wasn't always spoken of favorably, because those of you who are more or less my age, and for those of you that are, I'm so very sorry, you're sure to remember the anti-globalization movement. They organized large protests in Seattle, Prague, all around the world. But why were they protesting? Let's just say it would be easier to tell you why they weren't protesting. But in a nutshell, let's just say that these protesters thought that globalization served America's interests, that the rest of the world would simply provide raw materials and cheap labor to be exploited by multinationals. Globalization is itself a code word, a mask for not using the C word capitalism. It is a system. At the heart of this system is the United States of America, the world's only existing empire today. Tariq Ali, British Pakistani intellectual. In this way, the United States would get even richer by exporting its products and culture all around the world. We would get to a point where people would lose their very identity to an insidious capitalism. And where they used to eat kebabs with globalization, they would switch to eating Big Macs. <laughs> However, what we have seen in recent years is something very different. So yes, the United States economy has continued to grow and it has enormous weight in the world economy, but it's less and less dominant. To give you an idea, in the 1980s, the US accounted for about 25% of global GDP. Now, in 2020, it doesn't even reach 20%. And this is good news because it means the rest of the world is growing too. In fact, we could say that the main symbol of globalization is the kebab. This is a typical meal eaten in the Arab world. And when I was born, I didn't even know what it was. 
Florence. Now it's one more dining option along with pizzas, hamburgers or sushi. If the Scottish German Donner Kebab franchise is not the epitome of globalisation, please tell me what is. Skewer dead brilliant. The Glasgow firm selling one million pounds of kebabs a week. Anyway, if we focus now on the economic realm, what happened? Well, yes, it's true. The first companies that went into China were attracted by cheap labor. But for many millions of Chinese, as more and more companies arrived in the country, companies have had to compete for workers. And that means that wages are increasing. They have risen to such a degree that for three years, we've been seeing news headlines like this. China wage levels equal to or surpass parts of Europe. This is a trend that was seen a long time ago. Apple closed its last production line in the United States in 2004. By then, most of its product assembly had moved to China. However, by 2013, they had began to manufacture computers in Texas because the higher wages coupled with higher transportation costs from the Asian country meant China's competitive advantage over the United States was lower. And some of you are probably thinking, okay, good. So wages are increasing in China and at the same time, factories are leaving. What a disastrous development policy. But not really, because what has happened is that China has also become a market. The goal is no longer to produce goods in China purely for export, but also to sell them. A company like Lego has managed to survive the traditional toy crisis and the competition from the video games industry thanks to its sales in the Chinese market. Everything that had been lost in the West has been regained in China. Basically, we are talking about a market of 1.4 billion Chinese who are making more and more money. They have more and more yuan to buy our products. And of course, keeping China as a market is already incentive enough to keep factories in China no matter how much workers' wages rise, because transport costs are also very expensive. If you have to move tons and tons of your products on a cargo ship, a trans-oceanic trip lasting several weeks, you can imagine that it costs an arm and a leg. But if everything you produce in China can also be sold in China, you're going to save some logistics costs. That reason alone has caused a lot of factories to stay there. The numbers kind of speak for themselves. In 10 years, China has gone from exporting 17% of its total production to 9%. Demand in China has grown so much that a company setting up a factory in China would already be viable just for selling its products in China. But that's not the only reason. In the last 30 years, technology has evolved a lot. Machines are getting better and better at performing more and more functions automatically. And this is going to be a revolutionary change for some industries. Automation and artificial intelligence will transform labor-intensive manufacturing into capital-intensive manufacturing. This means that it will become increasingly attractive for companies to have a modern factory with state-of-the-art machinery rather than an outdated factory with many workers. So the wage factor will no longer be so important in deciding where to set up your factory. At this point, maybe what interests a business owner most is to set up several factories of, for example, toys at a regional level. I save the logistics costs, and if labour is more expensive in a particular region, I could also go with automation. I am no longer so interested in cheap labour as I have at my disposal good infrastructure, good suppliers, cheap energy, and highly skilled workers to handle machinery. On Visual Politic, we have already talked about 3D printers and additive manufacturing. Not just anyone can do this, you have to have specialized training. So, the last few years ultimately present us with an emerging trend, the regionalization of the value chain. What is produced in Asia is sold in Asia. What is produced in America is sold in America, and what is produced in Europe stays in Europe. And this trend has only accelerated, of course, with the trade war initiated by the United States. The Trump administration made having a factory in China for products that are to be sold in the United States counterintuitive. And while we were all busy with this, the event that changed everything arrived. And yes, it really has changed everything. Let's take a look at this right now. Coronanomics. Does the name ASML ring a bell? And that's not ASMR. That's a different channel of mine I'll be setting up in the future. It's a Dutch company that you've probably never heard of in your life, but it's fundamental in the world. They dominate the market of the most advanced chip manufacturing through the use of photolographic machines that make integrated circuits. ASML's work is with the world-leading chip producers, the US-based Intel, South Korean Samsung, and Taiwanese Taiwan Semiconductor. So these companies all use components manufactured by ASML to make motherboards. Motherboards like those used on your phone or mine. So without knowing it, you probably have an ASML product very close to you. And given that this is the case, it's time to consider the butterfly effect. 
just the flap of a butterfly's wings in Brazil set off a tornado in Texas? Edward Lorenz, American mathematician. This is what chaos theory is all about. Unpredictability. So let's imagine that ASML has to close for some unforeseen reason. Suddenly, smartphone production lines around the world would start to collapse. Manufacturers would hold on for as long as their stocks lasted, but there would soon be a shortage of chips. You think I'm exaggerating? Well, something similar actually happened in 2012 in the automotive industry. A fire broke out in Germany at a factory in Evonik. Evonik is the world's leading supplier of an essential resin for braking systems. And at that time, the consequences were soon felt everywhere. Fire in small German town could curb world car production. If there's just one concept that we have to get our heads around this year, it's that of the value chain, the supply chain. We're talking about the whole process in which the various companies and suppliers, possibly from several different countries, are involved in the production of goods. And as we mentioned earlier, it's true that one problem with global supply chains is that we have probably not achieved 100% true globalization when we consider what the term should really mean. Because when we say globalization, we are actually talking about seeing the United States, Europe and China trade with each other. We could add Japan, the Asian Tigers, Russia, and that's pretty much it for just now. You might want to add some other Asian country like Malaysia or Indonesia, but their numbers are still pretty low. India, for example, is known for having cheap call centers and excellent but cost-effective programmers, but we rarely see anything that says made in India. The bottom line is that the global supply chain is overly dependent on China, on levels that you cannot even begin to imagine. To give you an example, 95% of the ibuprofen consumed by the United States comes from China. Coronavirus could cause global medicine shortages as China's factory closures hit supply chains. Needless to say, this dependence on China is problematic because the supply chain becomes very vulnerable. Something like Trump's imposition of tariffs on Chinese steel is going to make many industries fail. But where the risk has been most visible has certainly been with the coronavirus. Overnight, China was totally quarantined, and that meant the temporary closure of a lot of factories. Some have struggled because they were used to China's production and logistics know-how. Their good work allowed foreign manufacturers to work work with the just-in-time philosophy to reduce expenses. Managing a large warehouse is more expensive than receiving the products and immediately distributing them to the stores. Just in time seeks to reduce inventories to a minimum. The goal is to have the exact amount of products in the right place at the right time. And this is why any factory that shuts down for weeks can cause serious supply chain problems. But the coronavirus crisis has also served to demonstrate which companies have been able to best survive the Chinese lockdown. And what some companies have tried to do is compensate for the closure by increasing production in their other factories in countries like Vietnam. Apple has moved some AirPods Pro manufacturing from China to Vietnam. As you can see, thanks to their factories in Vietnam, some have continued to produce despite the Chinese lockdown. So they were able to put one over their competitors. In the business world, many have taken note of this and have come to a conclusion, the concept of China plus one. That is, keep your factory in China and produce goods to get the yuan from those 1.4 billion Chinese consumers, but also try to set up somewhere else to protect you from any unforeseen events. Therefore, companies are not leaving China completely, they are simply diversifying with factories in other locations. What effect does this have on globalization? Well, let's take a look. Real globalization. We can sort of say that globalization 1.0 began when the United States launched the Marshall Plan. Western Europe had been greatly weakened by destruction during World War II. Helping Europe out of the hole, the United States got a top trading partner. And so it has continued to this day. From Asia would come version 2.0 of globalization, which is when Japan and the Asian Tigers started filling the global market with their products. When we were all kids, everything was made in Taiwan or made in Japan. But these countries have not only been producers, but are also important consumers. Globalization 3.0 is what we've seen in recent recent years, that shift towards trade with China. That moment when China became the factory of the world and has evolved to produce goods for its own great demand. The next step in globalization would be to expand into other countries, and steps are already being taken for that, such as how Apple has expanded its production into Vietnam. But stories like that are no longer exceptional, but fashionable. Look what the Taiwanese company Hon Hai, better known by its trade name Foxconn, the main assembler of the iPhone and the Nintendo Switch advertises from its 12 factories in China. 
Han Hai expands operations in India, Vietnam, amid trade tensions. But this issue goes beyond trade wars or the coronavirus. China is going to play a leading role in this new phase of globalization. In this expansion of globalization to other countries, there are places that are already becoming China's China. That is, places to which Chinese companies are outsourcing their production. This will cause China to expand trade ties with countries that will also benefit from this situation. And yes, we're talking about Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Bangladesh and the Philippines, but also other countries far removed from Beijing. China is turning Ethiopia into a giant fast fashion factory. But it's not just that Chinese companies are finding new places to set up their factories, or by encouraging companies to appear in other countries to which they are selling machinery to boost the production. China is also finding new markets for firms that have a lot of competition at home. This is the case with smartphone manufacturer Transient. The biggest phone seller in Africa is a little-known Chinese company. At the beginning of this video, we told you that politicians like Trump or Abe are pushing companies to leave China. What is happening is that some may leave, but everything indicates that the majority are betting on staying in China and opting for a China plus one strategy to reach other markets. So it seems that the coronavirus may not change things as much as we expected. True globalization, regionalization of value chains and the China plus one strategy, these are the trends that are being seen rather than the end of globalization. Now, the question is over to you. Do you think that this new phase of globalization will see all Africans eating noodles? Do you think Latin America's time could be just around the corner? And more importantly, burger or kebab? Kebab. Leave your answers in the comments below. We really hope you enjoyed this video. Please hit like if you did, and don't forget to subscribe for brand new videos. Also, if you click the little alarm down there, you'll get an update whenever we release one. Don't forget to check out our friends at the Reconsider Media Podcast. They provided in the vocals in this episode that were not my dulcet tones. Also, this channel is possible because of Patreon and our patrons on that platform. Please consider joining them and supporting our mission of providing independent political coverage. And as always, I'll see you in the next video. If you want to learn more about politics and world affairs and hear some more of my lovely voice, come check out the Reconsider podcast, where we don't do the thinking for you. Find Reconsider at www.reconsidermedia.com or on Apple or Google Play or your favorite podcatcher.